Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the LSE. And a particularly warm welcome to Chairman Bernanke. Um, back to the school. Uh, he spoke here last in 2004 when he was a governor, but it is, of course, the first time he's spoken here as chairman of the Fed. We are, as I think you all know, on quite a tight uh, timetable today. We did, do need to finish promptly at 2 o'clock. Uh, so by agreement uh, with the chairman, I am not going to go through a long introduction to his life going from uh, childhood onwards. Um, I, I will simply say a couple of things. First of all, that we were grateful to him for coming to deliver this lecture, which is in honour of Josiah Charles Stamp, who was an alumnus and governor of the school and who has endowed this uh, lecture series. And secondly, to say on a personal basis that I have been rather relieved in these uncertain times that we have someone with Chairman Bernanke's background in his position. Because, of course, he is the most distinguished economic historian of the Great Depression and has written at length about the policy mistakes made there and how to avoid them. And that has proved to be far more relevant experience than we might have suspected when he was appointed. Uh, indeed, there are other aspects of his former writings which are relevant. I may not be the only person who has Googled around recently and read his 2002 speech um, in Washington on quantitative easing, uh, which is now becoming uh, something of a bestseller. Uh, I think uh, it was presented then as a purely theoretical possibility, but nonetheless it's reassuring that the chairman of the Fed had thought hard about it at the time. That's all I'm going to say by way of introduction. He was born in Georgia. Just like the other bloke, he plays the saxophone, but he's not going to play that this afternoon. Chairman Bernanke, thank you. I thought you were going to uh, cover all my childhood sweethearts and, <laughs> and the like. It's very nice to be back here. I've enjoyed, I've been to the LSE many times, I've always enjoyed it. I enjoyed the lecture a few years ago, and uh, I'm glad to have the opportunity to be here again today, albeit for only a short time. For almost a year and a half, the global financial system has been under extraordinary stress, stress that has now decisively spilled over into the global economy more broadly. The proximate cause of the crisis was the turn of the housing cycle in the United States and the associated rise in delinquencies on subprime mortgages which imposed substantial losses on many financial institutions and shook investor confidence in credit markets. However, although the subprime debacle triggered the crisis, the developments in the U.S. mortgage market were only one aspect of a much larger and more encompassing credit boom whose impact transcended the mortgage market to affect many other forms of credit. Aspects of this broader credit boom included widespread declines in underwriting standards, breakdowns in lending oversight by investors and rating agencies, increased reliance on complex and opaque credit instruments that prove fragile under stress, and unusually low compensation for risk taking. The abrupt end of the credit boom has had widespread financial and economic ramifications. Financial institutions have seen their capital depleted by losses and write downs, and their balance sheets clogged by complex credit products and other illiquid assets of uncertain value. Rising credit risks and intense risk aversion have pushed credit spreads to unprecedented levels and markets for securitized assets, except for mortgage securities with government guarantees, have shut down. Heightened systemic risks, falling asset values and tightening credit have in turn taken a heavy toll on business and consumer confidence and precipitated a sharp slowing in global economic activity. The damage in terms of lost output, lost jobs, and lost wealth is already substantial. The global economy will recover, but the timing and the strength of the recovery are highly uncertain. Government policy responses around the world will be critical determinants 
of the speed and the vigor of the recovery. Today, I will offer some thoughts on current and prospective policy responses to the crisis in the United States, with particular emphasis on the responses by the Federal Reserve. In doing so, I will outline the framework that has guided the Federal Reserve's responses to date. I will also explain why I believe that the Federal Reserve still has powerful tools at its disposal to fight the financial crisis and the economic downturn, even though the overnight federal funds rate cannot be reduced meaning meaningfully further. The Federal Reserve has responded aggressively to the crisis since its emergence in, in the late summer of 2007. Following a cut in the discount rate, the rate at which the Federal Reserve lends to depository institutions, in August of that year, the Federal Open Market Committee began to ease monetary policy in September 2007, reducing the target for the federal funds rate by 50 basis points. As indications of economic weakness proliferated, the committee continued to respond, bringing down its target for the federal funds rate by a cumulative 325 basis points by the spring of 2008. In historical comparison, this policy response stands out as exceptionally rapid and proactive. In taking these actions, we aim both to cushion the direct effects of the financial turbulence on the economy and to reduce the virulence of the so-called adverse feedback loop in which economic weakness and financial stress become mutually reinforcing. These policy actions help to support employment and incomes during the first year of the crisis. Unfortunately, the intensification of the financial turbulence last fall led to further deterioration in the economic outlook. The committee responded by cutting the target for the federal funds rate an additional 100 basis points last October, with half of that reduction coming as part of an unprecedented coordinated interest rate reduction by six major central banks on October the 8th. In December, the committee reduced this target further, setting a range of zero to 25 basis points for the target federal funds rate. The committee's aggressive monetary easing was not without risks. During the early phase of the rate reductions, some observers expressed concern that these actions would stoke inflation. These concerns intensified as inflation reached high levels in mid-2008, mostly reflecting a surge in the prices of oil and other commodities. The committee takes its responsibility to ensure price stability very seriously. And throughout this period, it remained closely attuned to developments in inflation and inflation expectations. However, the committee also maintained the view that the rapid rise in commodity prices in 2008 primarily reflected sharply increased demand for raw materials in emerging market economies in combination with constraints in the supply of these materials rather than general inflationary pressures. Committee members expected that at some point global economic growth would moderate, resulting in slower increases in the demand for commodities and a leveling out in their prices as reflected, for example, in futures markets. As you know, commodity prices peaked during the summer and rather than leveling out, have actually fallen dramatically with the weakening in global economic activity. As a consequence, overall inflation has already declined significantly and appears likely to moderate further. The Fed's monetary easing has been reflected in significant declines in a number of lending rates, especially shorter term rates, thus offsetting to some degree the effects of the financial turmoil on economic conditions. However, that offset has been incomplete as widening credit spreads, more restrictive lending standards, and credit market dysfunction have worked against the monetary easing and led to tighter financial conditions overall. In particular, Many traditional funding sources for financial institutions and markets have dried up, and banks and other lenders have found their ability to securitize mortgages, auto loans, credit card receivables, student loans, and other forms of credit greatly curtailed. Thus, in addition to easing monetary policy, the Federal Reserve has worked to support the functioning of credit markets and to reduce financial strains by providing liquidity to the private sector. In doing so, as I will discuss shortly, the Fed has deployed a number of additional policy tools 
some of which were previously in our toolkit, and some of which have been created as the need arose. Although the federal funds rate is now close to zero, the Federal Reserve retains a number of policy tools that can be deployed against the crisis. One important policy tool is communication. Even if the overnight rate is close to zero, the committee should be able to influence longer term interest rates by informing the public's expectations about the future course of monetary policy. To illustrate, in its statement after its December meeting, the committee expressed the view that economic conditions are likely to warrant an unusually low federal funds rate for some time. To the extent that such statements cause the public to lengthen the horizon over which they expect short-term rates to be held at very low levels, they will exert downward pressure on longer-term rates, thereby stimulating aggregate demand. It is important, however, that statements of this sort be expressed in conditional fashion. That is, that they link policy expectations to the evolving economic outlook. If the public were to perceive a statement about future policy to be unconditional, then long-term rates might fail to respond in the desired fashion should the economic outlook change materially. Other than policies tied to current and expected values of the overnight uh, federal funds rate, the Federal Reserve has, and indeed has been actively using, a range of policy tools to provide direct support to credit markets and to the broader economy. As I will elaborate, I find it useful to divide these tools into three groups. Although these sets of tools differ in important respects, they have one aspect in common. They all make use of the asset side of the Federal Reserve's balance sheet. That is, each involves the Fed's authorities to extend credit or purchase securities. The first set of tools, which are closely tied to the central bank's traditional role as a lender of last resort, involve the provision of short-term liquidity to sound financial institutions. Over the course of the crisis, the Fed has taken a number of extraordinary actions to ensure that financial institutions have adequate access to short-term credit. These actions include creating new facilities for auctioning credit and making primary securities dealers, as well as banks, eligible to borrow at the Fed's discount window. For example, since August 2007, we have lowered the spread between the discount rate and the federal funds rate target from 100 basis points to 25 basis points, increased the term of discount window loans from overnight to 90 days, created the term auction facility, which auctions credit to depository institutions for terms of up to three months, put into place the term securities lending facility, which allows primary dealers to borrow treasury securities from the Fed against less liquid collateral, and initiated the primary dealer credit facility as a source of liquidity for those firms, among other actions. Because interbank markets are global in scope, the Federal Reserve has also approved bilateral currency swap agreements with 14 foreign central banks. The swap facilities have allowed these central banks to acquire dollars from the Federal Reserve to lend to banks in their own jurisdictions, which has served to ease conditions in dollar funding markets globally. In most cases, the provision of this dollar liquidity abroad was conducted in tight coordination with the Federal Reserve's own funding auctions. Importantly, the provision of credit to financial institutions exposes the Federal Reserve to only minimal credit risk. The loans that we make to banks and primary dealers through our various facilities are generally over collateralized and made with recourse to the borrowing firm. The Federal Reserve has never suffered any losses in the course of its normal lending to banks and now to primary dealers. In the case of currency swaps, the foreign central banks are responsible for repayment, not the financial institutions that ultimately receive the funds. Moreover, as further security, the Federal Reserve receives an equivalent amount of foreign currency in exchange for the dollars that it provides to foreign central banks. Liquidity provision by the central bank reduces systemic risk by assuring market participants that should short-term investors begin to lose confidence, financial institutions will be able to meet the resulting demands for cash 
without resorting to potentially destabilizing fire sales of assets. Moreover, backstopping the liquidity needs of financial institutions reduces funding stresses, and all else equal, should increase the willingness of those institutions to lend or to make markets. On the other hand, the provision of ample liquidity to banks and primary dealers is no panacea. Today, concerns about capital, asset quality, and credit risk continue to limit the willingness of many intermediaries to extend credit, even when liquidity is ample. Moreover, providing liquidity to financial institutions does not address directly instability or declining credit availability in critical non-bank markets, such as the commercial paper market or the market for asset-backed securities, both of which normally play major roles in the extension of credit in the United States. To address these issues, the Federal Reserve has developed a second set of policy tools, which involve the provision of liquidity directly to borrowers and investors in key credit markets. Notably, we have introduced facilities to purchase highly rated commercial paper at a term of three months and to provide backstop liquidity for money market mutual funds. In addition, the Federal Reserve and the Treasury have jointly announced a facility that will lend against AAA rated asset backed securities collateralized by student loans, auto loans, credit card loans, and loans guaranteed by the Small Business Administration. The Federal Reserve's credit risk, once again, will be minimal because the collateral will be subject to a haircut and the Treasury is providing $20 billion of capital as supplementary loss protection. We expect this facility to be operational next month. The rationales and objectives are of various facilities differ according to the nature of the problem being addressed. In some cases, as in our pro program to backstop the money market mutual funds, the purpose of the facility is to serve, once again, in classic central bank fashion, as liquidity provider of last resort. Following a prominent fund's breaking of the buck, that is, a decline in its net asset value below par in September, investors began to withdraw funds in large amounts from money market mutual funds that invest in private instruments such as commercial paper and certificates of deposit. Fund managers responded by liquidating assets and investing only at the shortest of maturities. As the pace of withdrawals increased, both the stability of the money market mutual fund industry and the functioning of the commercial paper market were threatened. The Federal Reserve responded with several programs, including a facility to finance bank purchases of high-quality asset-backed commercial paper from money market mutual funds. This facility effectively channeled liquidity to the funds, helping them to meet redemption demands without having to sell assets indiscriminately. Together with a treasury program that provided partial insurance to investors in money market mutual funds, these efforts have helped staunch the cash outflows from those funds and helped to stabilize that industry. The Federal Reserve's facility to buy high quality or A1P1 commercial paper at a term of three months was likewise designed to provide a liquidity backstop, in this case for investors and borrowers in the commercial paper market. As I mentioned, the functioning of that market deteriorated significantly in September, with borrowers finding financing difficult to obtain and then only at high rates and very short, usually overnight, maturities. By serving as a backstop, as a source of liquidity for borrowers, the Fed's commercial paper facility was aimed at reducing investor and borrower concerns about so-called rollover risk, the risk that a borrower could not raise new funds to repay maturing commercial paper. The reduction of rollover risk, in return, should increase the willingness of private investors to lend, particularly for terms longer than overnight. These various actions have appeared to improve the functioning of the commercial paper market as rates and risk spreads have come down and the average maturities of issuance have increased. In contrast, our forthcoming asset-backed securities program, a joint effort with the Treasury, is not purely for liquidity provision. 
This facility will provide three-year term loans to investors against AAA-rated securities backed by recently originated consumer and small business loans. Unlike our other lending programs, this facility combines Federal Reserve liquidity with capital provided by the Treasury, which allows it to accept some credit risk. By providing a combination of capital and liquidity, this facility will effectively substitute public for private balance sheet capacity in a period of sharp deleveraging and risk aversion in which such capacity appears to be very short. If the program works as planned, it should lead to lower rates and greater availability of consumer and small business credit. Over time, by increasing market liquidity and stimulating market activity, this facility should also help to revive private lending. Importantly, if the facility for asset-backed securities proves successful, its basic framework could be accommodated, expanded to accommodate higher volumes or additional classes of securities as circumstance, circumstances warrant. The Federal Reserve's third set of policy tools for supporting the functioning of credit markets involves the purchase of longer-term securities for the Fed's portfolio. For example, we recently announced plans to purchase up to $100 billion in government-sponsored enterprise debt and up to $500 billion in GSE mortgage-backed securities over the next few quarters. Notably, mortgage rates dropped significantly on the announcement of this program and have fallen further since it went into operation. Lower mortgage rates should help to support the housing sector. The committee is also evaluating the possibility of purchasing longer-term treasury securities. In determining whether to proceed with such purchases, the committee will focus on their potential to improve conditions in private credit markets, such as mortgage markets. These three sets of policy tools, lending to financial institutions, providing liquidity directly to key credit markets, and buying longer-term securities have as a common feature that each represents a use of the asset side of the Fed's balance sheet. That is, they all involve either lending or the purchase of securities. The virtue of these policies in the current context is that they allow the Federal Reserve to continue to push down interest rates and ease credit conditions in a range of markets despite the fact that the federal funds rate is now close to its zero lower bound. The Federal Reserve's approach to supporting credit markets is conceptually distinct from quantitative easing, the policy approach used by the Bank of Japan between 2001 and 2006. Our approach, which could be called credit easing, resembles quantitative easing in one respect. It involves an expansion of the central bank's balance sheet. However, in a pure QE regime, the focus of policy is on the quantity of bank reserves, which are liabilities of the central bank. The composition of loans and securities on the asset side of the, of the central bank's balance sheet in a QE regime is incidental. Indeed, although the banks of Japan's policy approach was multifaceted during the QE period, the overall stance of its policy was gauged primarily in terms of a target for bank reserves. In contrast, the Federal Reserve's credit easing approach focuses on the mix of loans and securities that it holds and how this composition of assets affects credit conditions for households and businesses. This difference does not reflect any doctrinal disagreement with the Bank of Japan but rather the differences in financial and economic conditions between the two episodes. In particular, credit spreads are much wider and credit markets more dysfunctional in the United States today than was the case during the Japanese experiment with quantitative easing. To stimulate aggregate demand in the current environment, the Federal Reserve must focus its policies on reducing those spreads and improving the functioning of private credit markets more generally. The stimulative effect of the Federal Reserve's credit easing policies depends sensitively on the particular mix of lending programs and security purchases that it undertakes. When markets are illiquid and private arbitrage is impaired by balance sheet constraints and other factors, as at present, 
One dollar of longer-term securities purchases is unlikely to have the same impact on financial markets and the economy as a dollar of lending to banks, which in turn has a different effect than a dollar of lending to support the commercial paper market. Because various types of lending have heterogeneous effects, the stance of Fed policy in the current regime, in contrast to a quantitative easing regime, is not easily summarized by a single number, such as the quantity of excess reserves or the size of the monetary base. In addition, the usage of Federal Reserve credit is determined in large part by borrower needs and thus will tend to increase when market conditions worsen and to decline when market conditions improve. Setting a target for the size of the Federal Reserve's balance sheet, as in a quantitative easing regime, could thus have the perverse effect of forcing the Fed to tighten the terms and availability of its lending at just the time when market conditions are worsening and vice versa. The lack of a simple summary measure or policy target poses an important communications challenge to the Federal Reserve. To minimize market uncertainty and achieve the maximum effect of its policies, the Federal Reserve is committed to providing the public as much information as possible about the use of its balance sheet, plans regarding future uses of its balance sheet, and the criteria on which the relevant decisions are based. Some observers have expressed the concern that by expanding its balance sheet, the Federal Reserve is effectively printing money, an action that will ultimately be inflationary. The Fed's lending activities have indeed resulted in a large increase in the excess reserves held by banks. <coughs> Bank reserves, together with currency, make up the, ne the narrowest definition of money, the monetary base. And as you would expect, this measure of money has risen significantly as the Fed's balance sheet has expanded. However, banks are choosing to leave the great bulk of their excess reserves idle, in most cases on deposit with the Fed. Consequently, the rates of growth of broader money aggregates like M1 and M2 have been much lower than that of the money base. At this point, with global economic activity weak and commodity prices at low levels, we see little risk of inflation in the near term. Indeed, we expect inflation to continue to moderate. However, at some point, when credit markets in the economy have begun to recover, the Federal Reserve will have to unwind its various lending programs. To some extent, this unwinding will happen automatically as improvements in credit markets should reduce the need to use Fed facilities. Indeed, where possible, we have tried to set lending rates and margins at levels that are likely to be increasingly unattractive to borrowers as financial conditions normalize. In addition, some programs, those authorized under the Federal Reserve's so-called 13-3 authority, which require a finding that conditions in financial markets are, quote, unusual and exigent, will by law have to be eliminated once the credit market conditions substantially normalize. However, as the unwinding of the Fed's various programs effectively constitutes a tightening of policy, the principal factor determining the timing and pace of that process will be the committee's assessment of the condition of credit markets and the prospects for the economy. As lending programs are scaled back, the size of the Federal Reserve's balance sheet will decline implying a reduction in excess reserves and in the monetary base. A significant shrinking of the balance sheet can be accomplished relatively quickly as a substantial portion of the assets that the Federal Reserve holds, including loans to financial institutions, currency swaps, and purchases of commercial paper, are short-term in nature and can simply be allowed to run off as the various programs and facilities are scaled back or shut down. As the size of the balance sheet and the quantity of excess reserves in the system decline, the Federal Reserve will be able to return to its traditional means of making monetary policy, namely by setting a target for the federal funds rate. Although a large portion of the Federal Reserve's assets are short-term in nature, we do hold, or expect to hold, significant quantities of longer-term assets, such as the mortgage-backed securities that we will be buying over the next two quarters. Although longer-term securities can also be sold, of course, we would not anticipate disposing of more than a small portion of these assets in the near term, which will slow the rate at which our balance sheet can shrink. 
We are monitoring the maturity composition of our balance sheet closely and do not expect a significant problem in reducing our balance sheet to the extent necessary at the appropriate time. Importantly, the management of the Federal Reserve's balance sheet and the conduct of monetary policy in the future will be made easier by recent congressional action to give the Fed the authority to pay interest on bank reserves. In principle, the interest rate the Fed pays on bank reserves should set a floor on the overnight interest rate, as banks should be unwilling to lend reserves at a rate lower than what they can receive from the Fed. In practice, the federal funds rate has fallen somewhat below the interest rate on reserves in recent months, reflecting the very high volume of excess reserves, the inexperience of banks with the new regime, and other factors. However, as excess reserves decline, financial conditions normalize, and banks adapt to the new regime, we expect the interest rate paid on reserves to become an effective instrument for controlling the federal funds rate. Moreover, other tools are available or can be developed to improve control of the federal funds rate during the exit stage. For example, the Treasury could resume its recent practice of issuing supplementary financing bills and placing the funds with the Federal Reserve. The issuance of these bills effectively drains reserves from the banking system, improving monetary control. Longer term assets can be financed through repurchase agreements and other methods, which also drains reserves from the system. <coughs> In considering whether to create or expand its programs, the Federal Reserve will carefully weigh the implications for the exit strategy. And we will take all necessary actions to ensure that the unwinding of our programs is accomplished smoothly and in a timely way, consistent with meeting our obligations to foster full employment and price stability. The Federal Reserve will do its part to promote economic recovery but other policy measures will be needed as well. The incoming administration and the Congress are currently discussing a substantial fiscal package that, if enacted, could provide a significant boost to economic activity. In my view, however, fiscal actions are unlikely to promote a lasting recovery unless they are accompanied by strong measures to further stabilize and strengthen the financial system. History demonstrates conclusively that a modern economy cannot grow if its financial system is not operating effectively. In the United States, a number of important steps have already been taken to promote financial stability, including the Treasury's injection of about $250 billion of capital into banking organizations, a substantial expansion of guarantees of bank liabilities by the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, as well as the Fed's various liquidity programs. Those measures together with analogous actions in many other countries, likely prevented a global financial meltdown in the fall that had it occurred would have left the global economy in far worse condition than it is today. However, with the worsening of the economy's growth prospects, continued credit losses and asset markdowns may maintain for a time the pressure on the capital and balance sheet capacities of financial institutions. Consequently, more capital injections and guarantees may become necessary to ensure stability and the normalization of credit markets. A continuing barrier to private investment in financial institutions is the large quantity of troubled, hard-to-value assets that remain on institutions' balance sheets. The presence of these assets significantly increases uncertainty about the underlying value of these institutions and may inhibit both new private investment and new lending. Should the Treasury decide to supplement injections of capital by removing troubled assets from institution's balance sheet, as was initially proposed by the U.S. Financial Rescue Plan, several approaches might be considered. Public purchases of troubled assets are, of course, one possibility. Another is to provide asset guarantees under which the government would agree to absorb, presumably in exchange for warrants or some other form of compensation, part of the prospective losses on specified portfolios of troubled assets held by banks. Yet another approach would be to set up and capitalize so-called bad banks, which would purchase assets from financial institutions in exchange for cash and equity in the bad bank. These methods are similar from an economic perspective, although they would have somewhat different operational and accounting implications. In addition, 
Efforts to reduce preventable foreclosures, among other benefits, could strengthen the housing market and reduce mortgage losses, thereby also contributing to financial stability. The public in many countries is understandably concerned by the commitment of substantial government resources to aid the financial industry when other industries receive little or no assistance. This disparate treatment, unappealing as it is, appears unavoidable. Our economic system is critically dependent on the free flow of credit, and the consequences for the broader economy of financial instability are thus powerful and quickly felt. Indeed, the destructive effects of financial instability on jobs and growth are already evident worldwide. Responsible policymakers must therefore do what they can to communicate to their constituencies why financial stabilization is essential for economic recovery and is therefore in the broader public interest. Even as we strive to stabilize financial markets and institutions worldwide, however, we also owe the public near-term, concrete actions to limit the probability and severity of future crises. We need stronger supervisory and regulatory systems under which gaps and unnecessary duplication in coverage are eliminated, lines of supervisory authority and responsibility are clarified, and oversight powers are adequate to curb excessive leverage and risk-taking. In light of the multinational character of the largest financial firms, and the globalization of financial markets more generally, regulatory oversight should be coordinated internationally to the greatest extent possible. We must continue our ongoing work to strengthen the financial infrastructure. For example, by encouraging the migration of trading and credit default swaps and other derivatives to central counterparties and to exchanges. The supervisory authority should develop the capacity for increased surveillance of the financial system as a whole rather than focusing excessively on the condition of individual firms in isolation. And we should revisit capital regulations, accounting rules, and other aspects of the regulatory regime to ensure that they do not induce excessive procyclicality in the financial system and in the economy. As we proceed with regulatory reform, however, we must take care not to take actions that forfeit the economic benefits of financial innovation and market discipline. Particularly pressing is the need to address the problem of financial institutions that are deemed too big to fail. It is unacceptable that large firms that the government is now compelled to support to preserve financial stability were among the greatest risk takers during the boom period. The existence of too big to fail firms also violates the presumption of a level playing field among financial institutions. In the future, financial firms of any type whose failure would pose a systemic risk, must accept especially close regulatory scrutiny of their risk taking. Also urgently needed in the United States is a new set of procedures for resolving a failing non-bank institution when deemed systemically critical, analogous to the rules and powers that currently exist for resolving banks under the so-called systemic risk exception. The world today faces both short-term and long-term challenges. In the near term, the highest priority is to promote a global economic recovery. The Federal Reserve retains powerful policy tools and will use them aggressively to help achieve this objective. Fiscal policy can stimulate economic activity, but a sustained recovery will also require a comprehensive plan to stabilize the financial system and to restore normal flows of credit. Despite the understandable focus on the near term, we do not have the luxury of postponing work on the longer term issues. High on the list in light of recent events are strengthening regulatory oversight and improving the capacity of both the private sector and regulators to detect and manage risk. And finally, a clear lesson of the recent period is that the world is too interconnected for nations to go it alone in their economic, financial, and regulatory policies. International cooperation is thus essential if we are to address the crisis successfully and provide the basis for a healthy, sustained recovery. Thank you for your attention.
Thank you very much. Well, an enormous amount of um, food for thought, and we have um, 20 minutes to eat it. Um, so uh, if you could put your hands up, those who have questions, and if I could ask you to be succinct and also to give your name and to wait for a microphone, and you catch my eye first. Right, and the microphone will be on its way to you. Do you still believe, a very simple question, do you still believe in the inherent goodness of Wall Street entrepreneurs considering recent scandals? In the, in the inherent goodness? Um, I, I think at the LSE you may have heard of someone named Adam Smith. Let's write that down. Let's write that one down. <laughs> who said that the remarkable thing about a market system is that the greed and self-aggrandizement of individuals is somehow mysteriously transmuted into the welfare of the uh, public as a whole. And markets working uh, effectively and properly can do that. And we certainly don't want to lose the strengths of the market system as we, for example, consider new regulations. Having said that, the financial system is a, is a peculiar case, uh, is on the one hand a tremendous source of growth and innovation, uh, source of income here in London and, and many other places. But on the other hand, for hundreds of years, periodically, the financial system has gone into booms and crises. And some of those crises have been very costly. Um, 1930s comes to mind, and, and the recent experience shows how powerful the effects of, uh, of a financial crisis on the real economy can be. So without passing judgment on the morals of investment bankers, some of whom are probably very decent people, um, the, the purpose is not to, uh, to uh, impose morality, the purpose is to make the market system work so that when individuals uh, act in their own interests, as they are inclined to do in matters of business and finance, that the resulting outcomes will be good for everybody. And in the financial system, uh, because of this tendency to booms and crises, a certain amount of regulation and oversight appears to be necessary. Uh, the trick is to do it in a balanced way that will control excessive risk-taking, excessive leverage, crises, while not abandoning all the benefits of venture capital and, and, and lending to new industries and all the things that are important for economic growth. Thank you. Yes, one right at the back red tie, just underneath the camera there. <coughs> Thank you. That's an Adam Smith tie, by the way, from the Adam Smith Foundation. Uh, thank you, Dr. Bernanke. I really appreciate, as we all do, your, your uh, challenge in dealing with the systemic financial systems crisis. I'm Terry Easton with Human Events Newspaper in Washington, D.C. The concern that we have is that right now we're dealing with this problem looking at the forest at the tree level. In fact, probably down on the, on the ground looking at the blaze of grass growing. And you seem to be dealing with it, as all people are in all similar institutions worldwide, as a, a classic Keynesian approach to solve the problem. Of course, here at the London School of Economics, there is some knowledge of another alternative approach to the problem, and known as, of course, the Austrian School, uh, von Mises, Hayek, Rothbard, et cetera, have suggested an alternative to this 90-year edifice that we've built uh, which now is coming back to, uh, to root. And I wonder if it's possible, realizing that your position is the head of the Fed, can you talk a little bit about the, the underlying system that has now existed for 90 years? Are we going the right way? Can we fix it? Should we look at these alternatives to the problem? I'd be interested in your philosophical comments. Well, that's, the question is related to the, to the former one. It has to do with the value and benefits of markets. And... Um, I think economists uh, are often accused of being market fundamentalists. I think, in fact, economists have done a better job than anybody of figuring out what markets can do well and what they don't do so well uh, when there are problems of information or other things. Um, and economists have also pointed out that uh, government interventions are not benign, perfectly executed interventions, but are also executed by individuals with interests and so on. This is the public policy or uh, uh, a school, um, and so the balance between markets and uh, and, and the government is a, is a delicate one. Um, in particular, uh, those of us who are economists, and I think that counts almost everybody in the room, um, are always amazed by the uh, lack of understanding in the general public about the power of markets 
And in particular, uh, the Austrian school emphasized the ability of markets to aggregate information and, and, and to provide, in, between information and incentives, to provide outcomes which a top-down government approach uh, can't, uh, can't provide. Um, so as an economist, I have uh, a lot of uh, faith in markets. I, I don't think, for example, I would completely disagree with the view that what's happened in the last year and a half is a crisis of capitalism per se. I mean, after all, capitalism has done an awful lot uh, for growth and living standards for a long time. Uh, but rather, it's a crisis that arises in a particular set of situations and conditions that we have faced in the last uh, couple of years. In particular, um, as I indicated before, uh, we, because of the tendency of financial systems to boom and bust, which is a very long-standing problem, one that was recognized by by uh, virtually every economist uh, who's, who's studied uh, these issues, and because of the effects of that on the economy, um, there's been uh, a long-standing tendency to try to find a regulatory balance that reduces the, the cost of those booms and busts without costing us the benefits of the, the market forces and the innovation and the information aggregation and so on. It's a very difficult, difficult balance. I think, uh, you know, what we've learned in this case is not necessarily that we need to have a lot more regulation, but we need to think through what went wrong with, when I describe, when I say the financial system, I mean private sector plus the regulatory overlay. That whole complex didn't perform well in this case, and we need to think very hard about, about uh, how to fix it. Now, as I try to say in my speech, we have both short-term and long-term considerations. Um, you know, I. I think it's very important for us to try to put out the fire. I think it's a good, good advice in general that if there's a fire burning, you try to put it out first and then you think about the fire code. So you, know, you don't try to do it all at once necessarily. Uh, we, need to, we need to figure out how to solve this problem, how to stop the, uh, the costs that are being borne all over the world. Um, but going forward, we have to look at the fire code. We have to think about what is the right balance of regulation markets that will give us a, uh, a powerful, innovative uh, financial system, but, but, but uh, one that will be safer to use in some sense. Thank you. Uh, yes, you put him there. The, um, that's it, stripy tie. So it's the man with the stripy tie there. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> You'll have to go and get a stripy tie if you want to ask the question. <laughs> okay. I'll, I'll lend it to you. You can have it this. next, okay? Uh, Hugh Pym, BBC News. What advice would you have for the British authorities on issues like boosting the money supply and other measures to get credit flowing around the economy? Well, I've had um, uh, numerous occasions to, uh, to talk to um, British authorities. I met today with the Prime Minister, with the uh, Finance Minister and the Central Bank Governor. Um, I've known Mervyn King in particular for a very long time. Uh, 25 years ago, we were assistant professors sharing an office in, in MIT, and we got to talking about a few things, and the conversation's been going on ever since. Um, so I, I, have been, uh, <laughs> I have been trying to, um, uh, to be in touch and discuss these issues. Um, I want to be very careful because, uh, on the one hand, there are obviously some commonalities. Uh, the U.S. and the U.K. are facing uh, tremendous financial stress. Um, that financial stress is having impact on the real economy and employment and growth, um, and we all want to, uh, to address that. Um, on the other hand, the, the specifics of our institutional structures, the, the set of markets, for example, the United States relies more on commercial paper markets than the UK. We have um, uh, these uh, government-sponsored enterprises which are critical to the housing system. Um, uh, as a larger country, we, uh, we have less of the problem that our major banks are spread all over the world with only relatively a minority of their assets actually within the country, and so there's a whole different set of circumstances. Um, so, you know, I try not to be too prescriptive, frankly. Uh, but we've talked about, uh, you know, issues of monetary policies, issues of how to address um, uh, credit market problems, as I discussed in my, in my lecture today. We've discussed issues of how to improve regulation. We've been, uh, we have coordinated our policies, you know. On October the 8th, as I mentioned in my remarks, uh, six major central banks, including the Bank of England and the Fed, coordinated in a, in a 50 basis point um, uh, interest rate cut. Um, and moreover, we have been extensively involved in these currency swaps, as I mentioned, whereby 
uh, we provide dollars in exchange for the foreign currency to the Bank of England or the European Central Bank to lend money to the, um, uh, to the domestic uh, uh, institutions. Um, so I think, you know, I, I don't think I need to give advice. I think we have broadly the same set of issues, somewhat different institutional features. I think we're all looking at monetary policy. We're thinking about what happens when monetary policy is exhausted or there are credit market problems that monetary policy can't handle. We're thinking about uh, fiscal policy. We're thinking about um, stabilizing the financial system, which is a difficult problem, particularly given the uh, special features that we're seeing, like uh, complex uh, securities and so on. And we're all thinking about, uh, about regulatory reform. And in particular, of course, uh, the, the UK is, the, uh, is hosting the G20 uh, and the G20 uh, leaders meetings uh, coming up this spring, where uh, there will be discussions about regulatory change and how that can be done in a way that will be, in particular, as I mentioned in my remarks, not just effective, but internationally coordinated. And I think that's very, very important. So we have lots of conversations. We have lots of things in common. Um, and we'll continue that dialogue. Well, seeing Gordon Brown will have allowed you to thank him for saving the world, um, which uh, you don't need to comment on that, not even smile. <laughs> uh, the one in front, yes, the man with the... Uh, My name is Felix Posen. Could you comment on the issue of the Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac giving mortgage rates of over 100% of the value of a home? Wasn't that just an extraordinary matter which was really in governmental hands as those are governmental organizations and did an untold amount of damage? Well, um, the, uh, the Federal Reserve, on, you know, on a, lot of these, a lot of the things that have happened, certainly I didn't predict and many other people didn't predict, but, but one thing that was forecast was problems with the Fannie and Freddie. Uh, the Federal Reserve for at least a decade or more, going back to my predecessor, actively was concerned about the, the, the public-private um, joint, you know, the, the, the conflict of interest between the private shareholders and the public responsibilities. We were particularly concerned, and I think this was the real issue. I, I, your, your question about the quality of mortgages, I don't think that Fannie and Freddie's mortgages were worse than average. I think they were probably better than average because they were required to, um, to buy securities and buy mortgages that had the equivalent of uh, 80, of 20, 80, 80, 20, 20%, 80 loan to value, 20% down payment. Um, so when they, when they bought uh, subprime mortgages, they were usually packaged in larger securities that supposedly had more credit guarantees or supports than the underlying, than some of the underlying mortgages did. So I, I don't know if the problem was so much that Fannie and Freddie were particularly uh, uh, a problem in terms of buying uh, uh, weaker mortgages. I think the problem was basically that um, they didn't really have enough capital. Uh, so when they came to a, a period like the present where uh, not only were there, of course, substantial losses in subprime and other uh, lower credit score type mortgages, but of course there have been losses now even in, in, in higher quality prime mortgages, and the very thin sliver of capital that the uh, Fannie and Freddie had was, was insufficient and, and, and therefore uh, the, the, the investors lost uh, faith in the GSEs in the summer, and the government basically had to take them into conservatorship. Um, so now the government, which had for a long time, quote, implicitly guaranteed, there was at least an expectation among investors that the government would step up, and that ambiguity was in fact one source of the problem because the, 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 this implicit guarantee meant that the Fannie and Freddie could, could uh, raise money without market discipline you know, without oversight from investors because everybody assumed the government was going to guarantee them anyway. And now, in fact, the government has had to step in and put in lots of public money in order to keep them uh, afloat. But I think the main problem was uh, inadequate capital and inadequate market discipline for many, many years. And it's going to be a very challenging uh, issue for the new administration. You know, what, what should we do next with, with these organizations? Should they be returned to their previous uh, form? Should they be privatized, made entirely public? I've, I've given them a speech on this where I went over some of the options. Uh, Secretary Paulson recently gave some remarks on this. It's a, it's a big question for us because they're a big part of our housing market. But um, at least in this case, I think um, the, the financial distress was something that was foreseeable and was foreseen. Uh, third row from the back, yeah, man, uh, sorry, Sushil Wadwani. Uh, I, uh, Chairman Bernanke, I wanted to ask you a question about uh, a hypothetical country 
where there is a central bank uh, which is considering both quant easing and credit easing broadly along your lines. Uh, it has a, uh, the current government broadly sympathizes. However, uh, the main opposition party is opposed to both quant easing and credit easing. And in this hypothetical country, there might be an election in the next 18 months. <laughs> uh, and, and, and what do you think the central bank should do? Uh, uh, and and if, if I may, I'll just ask a very quick second question. Uh, is this a hypothetical question? <laughs> uh, and, and my second question was, uh, you know, uh, some readings of Keynes would suggest the primacy of animal spirits uh, and such like. Uh, and uh, those interpretations of Keynes would suggest that uh, pouring a lot of capital into banks uh, and taking the toxic securities off their balance sheets were unlikely to have a much stimulative effect for a very long time. And if you accept that interpretation, what, what is it that we need to do uh, to get confidence up? Uh, and I'm not alone in, uh, in this kind of interpretation of Keynes. Uh, I know George Akerlof and uh, Robert Schiller have been writing a lot uh, along these lines recently. Well, on, on the second question, I think um, financial stability uh, may not be a sufficient condition for growth and prosperity, but it's certainly a necessary condition. And as I said uh, in my remarks, we have to make sure that the system is uh, stable and uh, is working at least in a reasonable way. Uh, otherwise, we won't have the financial basis for, for, for sound growth. Now, if you, if you believe the Keynesian perspective, as you just described it, um, I guess there's two responses. One is that confidence is very important, and so you have to you know, there's a certain amount of psychology here. You have to diagnose what appears to be a, a, a crisis of confidence around the world. Where did it come from? To the extent it's related to financial instability and all the uncertainties in financial markets, then stabilizing that situation, bringing investors back to the stock market, to capital markets in general, might be a boost to confidence, might be helpful in that respect. The other possibility, of course, which I guess is implicit in your question and in the Keynesian perspective would be to use government spending or government tax cuts as a fiscal policy, which is something that many countries, of course, are, are contemplating right now. On the other question, I'm, I, it's so hypothetical, I was un difficult to, uh, to answer, other than to say that, that a hypothetical central bank that is hypothetically independent uh, <laughs> would make monetary policy based on its legitimate powers and on its assessment of the economy as independently as possible from the political process. We'll take one last question, and a uh, woman there with uh, specs. Yeah. There it is. Hi. Yes, I'm wondering how long it's going to take um, with these policy responses for middle America to stop seeing the job cuts, or if it's going to get worse before it gets better. Stop seeing what? Job the, cuts. the job, job losses cuts. and the job cuts. Well, it's difficult to say, frankly. The, uh, you know, the job losses have accelerated. Um, uh, it was a very, 2008 was a very bad year. We had uh, something like 2.8 million jobs lost, which is about 2% of all employment. And it was accelerating. In the, in the last two months of the year, we had more than a million jobs lost. So we're currently in a very bad uh, uh, stage of the uh, contraction as far as employment is concerned. And I would expect to see continued weakness in the first quarter. Um, as we look forward, um, uh, there's a lot of uncertainty, but I'm, I'm hopeful that you know, later in 2009, uh, depending on factors, particularly including financial and credit markets, we should begin to see some stabilization in the economy, um, uh, if not rapid growth, at least a stabilization uh, and, a, and, a, and a stop to the bleeding, in a sense. Uh, it takes a while, though, for labor markets to recover. We've seen in the last uh, two recessions in 1991 and in 2001 that even after the economy began to grow, there was a, it took some time before jobs came back, but I think the first, uh, the first order of business is to, is to arrest the decline, to stabilize the system. Um, that will uh, attenuate what is, I think, very much a crisis of confidence on a global level, and that will, I hope, at least stop you know, subsequent losses. It will take some time before we're back to where we started from. Thank you. Chairman, we really appreciate you coming to our um, hypothetical school um, <laughs> in this uh, 
hypothetical country um, in which we live. Um, it's great that you do make time to re-engage with an academic audience at a time when the debates in academia but also in policy circles are so lively. I'm sure there's a lot for both sides to contribute to each other. So we're enormously grateful to you for coming. Could you possibly uh, stay seated just for two seconds uh, to allow the chairman to make his good his escape, um, but also thank him. And my plane. Thank you. Thank you.